Back in the days of classic TV series, you could always tell when a production ran out of money, as you'd get the filler episode. Ok, it won't be as boring as it sounds. Let's go and have a look behind the scenes of the Vintage Collector. It's obsolete technology no one uses today, but I'll bring it back to life. I'm the Vintage Collector and these are my stories. Most of the filming happens here, in my workshop. Though there wouldn't be one if my wife and I didn't inherit this 1974 building that we eventually tore down in its entirety. The workshop was then built into the former house entrance and there's always some stuff sitting in line for being picked up for a repair like here the IBM PCXT and these two compact portables. And look here's another thing, a 3D printer I have currently on loan and is waiting to be put to some good use as well. And besides the workshop is the man cave, otherwise known as the room of requirement. Oh, a Harry Potter fanboy as it seems. Shut up already! So here I'm having my precious SGI machines, but also some others you have been seeing before, like the high screen 386 machine with the Kalani designed case, or the Compact Presario 425, which was a year long restoration process. And here's the C64, which still is waiting for a keyboard repair. I also have this nice DEC VT100 terminal, which actually serves as a real serial terminal to those two replicas of the Altair 8800 and the PDP-11. And here again another compact, the Presario CDS524 that was also briefly mentioned in my previous video. And as you can see, it too had the CRT replaced, because I couldn't find a suitable replacement. It, like the C64, is used for occasional fun gaming of retro games. But there's another one for gaming, which is this arcade-like game table. I furnished this myself out of an IKEA table, and it's powered by Raspberry Pi and Emulation Station, so I can run all arcade games as well as old Nintendo games like Super Mario Land. But it's not all fun and games. Sometimes it's also about serious stuff. Like checking and formatting floppy disks, removing old labels, throwing away defective ones. This is certainly not one of the most beloved topics. No, but I prefer to keep floppies from unknown sources all tidied up. And most of the time a quick format is just good enough. And using this simple shell trick you can actually run the format command without any annoying prompts. Just provide the two blank lines with a carriage return and the N with a carriage return as well and pipe it into the format command. It's a bit more archaic than a Unix shell but it does the job. Sometimes also come along salvage floppies which contain something interesting. I typically create the disk image using DD and also image disk and if it's worthwhile preserving I provide it to winworldpc.com. But thankfully it's not just always these boring activities. And not all systems I get into possession need a repair, like this Apple PowerBook Duo from 1992. All this one needed was just a fresh install of System 7. But once installed? Where does it go? Yeah, I wonder about that myself. Indeed, one needs a place other than just storing these machines into some boxes, right? So in summer 2021, I had the idea to reuse that former bomb shelter, which served as a storage room before. So I installed a floating cork laminate onto the floor and repainted some of the walls in orange and green, a hint at the old amber and green CRT displays of the past. I wouldn't remove the armory doors and the ventilation systems, so I needed to adapt some of the furniture accordingly. For placing some of the items on display I mounted some open shelves. I also realized that the floating floor would tend to bend up a little bit, so I retroactively added some baseboards before finally moving all the equipment in. 
Granted, I have far too many systems to put all of them on display, but there's enough room for the mobile and ultra portable section, an Apple corner and a far bigger corner for the IBM compatible mobile computers. For the most, I'm collecting portable systems, with just a few exceptions. If a £30 IBM PC portable really qualifies as a portable. Yeah, anyway. Like here, the Kalani designed high screen laptops, or the Toshiba T3100. Several compact systems. In particular, my collection of the compact portable series, which in the meantime covers four generations with the Portable Plus, the Portable 2, the Portable 3 and the Portable 386. For my Ultra Mobiles, I feature both the Atari portfolio and an earlier pre-Atari model, which still went by the DIP brand name. Some of the most recent systems in my collection include a variation of netbooks, which were the thing around 15 years ago, like the very first ASUS EPC701, which kicked off the netbook hype back then. I even featured this special Acer Aspire 1 netbook, which was branded by Migro, a Swiss omni-market retailer. The branding here is M budget, which is positioned by Migro to deliver good quality at lowest price, not just for groceries, but also for other segments like, well, electronics. It is hard to explain why, but M budget has developed kind of a cult following here in Switzerland. And while there is nothing special about this pretty much standard netbook machine, the branding makes it special and that's the reason why I have it in my collection. And of course there's a lot more to see, like manuals and software. I don't have too many of these, but I'm especially proud of these IBM original library items, which still reflect the value of printed documentation and outside presentation as it was given for the early releases when the IBM PC entered the market. Over the years manuals have become thinner and thinner until they eventually vanish completely, especially with nowadays mostly digital downloads. Long before the dawn of digital downloads there was Monsters like this, original IBM PC 5150. Or here, the slightly evolved 30 pounds IBM PC portable. Although not the first commercially available portable machine, because that honor goes to the 1981 Osborne 1. Having said that, there's still a lot to do. When I built the museum, I didn't install a network yet. And as teased in my last video, that's definitely one of the upcoming topics aside the Compact Portable Plus and the Portable 3 restorations, an insight into virtualization on SGI IRIX, playing around with Windows 3.0 on the HP 200 LX, fixing the CC. Hold it, hold it, don't tell them yet the entire 2023 agenda. Alright then, know it all has spoken. Though, if you saw something you want me to tell more about, then let me know in the comments below. I'm the Vintage Collector, and this was my story for today. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Next time on the Vintage Collector, this £30 machine boots up just fine. What's that? Not all keys are working, and why am I missing a knob here? If you check out this channel's community tab, you'll find some polls on potential upcoming videos. You're very welcome to upvote on upcoming topics or drop in new ones you'd like me to chase down.